Hello, everyone, and welcome to Phil Notes. My name is Geraldine Vega, and I am the office leader in the Soul Survey Office in Tolan, Connecticut, and the Phil Notes Regional Representative for the Northeast Soil Silver Region. As a regional representative, I serve on the Phil Notes Review Committee. The review committee solicits and selects topics for each webinar. We have selected two exciting topics for today's live event, but first, Let's go over a few housekeeping items. This is a Microsoft Live event, not a Teams meeting, which means you are joining today's webinar in listen-only mode. We encourage you to ask questions at any time using the Q&A panel. The Q&A panel should open by default. However, if for some reason your Q&A panel is not open, simply click on the question mark icon located in the upper right side of your screen. For closed captions, turn on the live caption button located in the lower right corner. Today's session is being recorded. Recorded sessions are available in Teams on the Phil Notes channel and the Soil and Plant Science Division YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoy today's session. And with that, I would like to turn it over to the Phil Notes moderator, Dave Hoover, to tell you a little more about today's webinar. Take it away, Dave. Thank you, Geraldine. And welcome to the 31st Field Notes webinar. Here's a map of where the 64 presentations that we've heard so far have been from. So most all parts of the country are represented, although I'm sure there are some great things happening in the far southeast and even in West Texas. And there's a range of the general topics that have been presented too. See that most of them are field investigations and initial soil survey uh, explorations, but uh, quite a range of other topics have been presented too. I was thinking back to the uh, to the the start of field notes, uh, the early team of folks that conceptualized and designed the field notes webinar series. Uh, myself, Christy Wiley, Paul Reich, uh, Kevin Norwood, Luis Hernandez, uh, probably more that my uh, fading memory apologizes for forgetting. Uh, we worked on branding and Christy designed our current logo as well as promoted the idea of adding regional field staff to the selection committees. A really big shout out to producer Paul Reich who is meets every month in advance of the webinar with presenters to practice their presentations and gets it gets them all ready and then runs the webinar for us. Those that know me know that I love numbers, so uh, a couple of numbers on attendance. Uh, we've had 4,013 attendees at the live webinars. And we have had, since all of them are posted uh, online to our YouTube channel, we've had 4,642 more views online. So that's more people than have watched the introduction to NRCS YouTube video. So we're just glad to have had that many people that not only see it live, but tune in later to watch what they've missed. And there have been even more 60 second uh, promos on X. Well, really, this is one of the really good success stories of the Soil and Plant Science Division. And I'm mentioning all of this because I'm proud to have been associated with Field Notes. This will be my last one as a moderator since I'm retiring. Now I get to be one of the audience every month. This is where I plan on staying connected with my science. Well, speaking about learning things, let's move ahead with our agenda for the day. We're starting off with Margie Patz from Montana, who's going to talk about dynamic soil properties on rangelands and the link to ecological site descriptions. Margie, the broadcast is yours. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate all that you've done for the soil plant site Let me know when my slides are visible. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, and now we can hear your voice too. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for letting me know that my mic tends to fade out a little bit. So if I fade out, please let me know and I will try to readjust again. 
Will do. You're doing great right now. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. And again, I'm I'm excited to and excited for your new adventure. And also I'm grateful for everything that you've done for the Soil and Plant Sciences Division. And it is my pleasure to be here today and to be sharing my knowledge and experiences with ESDs, as well as conservation planning and how it all ties back to dynamic soil properties. As we move through, as I, well, let me back up. When I began my career with the NRCS as a rangeland management specialist in Nebraska and Wyoming, I really enjoyed the time that I spent working with producers and building the conservation plans and putting practices in, onto their operations. That one on one involvement with what they were doing and learning off the landscape was insurmountable. As I moved to the soil and plant science division, I really missed that one on one interaction with the landowners, but it is exciting to grow in my knowledge and has been exciting to participate in the building the science that is now supporting the decisions being made on the landscape by our producers and landowners. So as we move in through today, I just want to start off by just clarifying just a little bit. In my college days, when we were discussing range sites, our primary focus was on those key plants for management and how, the depict, how, the depict, how they depicted the range site as we looked at it on the ground. Again, we looked at soil only in a minor framework. We really focused on those plants. And the driving change for shifts in the plants were related to grazing by livestock or wildlife. We really didn't consider other changes out there. And that change was in a linear fashion that would inevitably shift from historic climax plant communities to a degraded state or degraded plant community and then back again. And the fix to any change that occurred was always management. So very little focus was given to the soils, the time frame of change, and all the other abiotic factors that we now see as driving forces within the ecological concept. So what started this alteration to history? Why did we shift from rain sites to a complex ecological site? Well, it really does come down to the art and science of land management. As more studies and research have occurred, or the science of things, and as the more knowledge is gained, the more understanding of the systems that we gain, and that leads us to a more successful on the ground application of the science. And that application is where the money meets the road. So to begin the process of science, the first step was really realizing that soils are the foundation to the concept of ecological sites. The type of soil and the development process of the soils in an area are the keystones to understanding the ecological concept and the documented functions within the ecological site descriptions or ESDs. Within the concept, the focus of each ecological site will vary, but consideration is given to each of the major properties. Initially, the key properties are the parent material of the soils, understanding the geology and formation of the soils in relation to the landform. With this, texture of these soils plays a significant role in many instances, and understanding the surface and how the textures may change throughout the profile, establishing the family particle size and detailing the clay content and how it may or may not shift in the profile. The connection of these properties to the drainage, permeability and runoff classes helps to relate to the ecohydraulic processes and erosion potential of these soils. Properties that can be further affected by depth of soil, further properties that can be further affected are the depth of soil or depth to restrictive layers or other diagnostic features, including the size, shape and amount of surface and surface fragments. Chemistry has always played a factor in soils, but with time and further research into soils and plants, more emphasis is being given to the type, amount, depth, and characteristics of that chemistry and understanding how it's interacting throughout the soil profile. That understanding is the effects of the chemistry on other properties that are noted. But one major property that plays a role in almost all soils is available water capacity and its effect on the soils and the plant interactions. So now that we kind of have that foundation of soil set, science has extended us to further frame out the ecological concept by developing the walls or the framework or boundaries of that concept. This framework really focuses on the larger scale features, including the climate variability that occurs within 
MLRAs, LRUs, or even potentially subsets, and understanding that annual fluctuation and extremes of the precipitation temperature and how it affects the growth cycle and growth patterns within our designated areas. Determining the physiographic features of the concept and how it relates to other concepts on the landform and position, elevation, slope, and aspect are all key. And also to the hydraulic features, understanding how surface and groundwater movement is influencing the concept and, and, the, and making the implication to vegetative potentials, soil erosion potential, and the stability of the site, are again, are key to understanding that framework of our ecological concept. So now we have a visible acknowledged framework with a solid foundation that can be identified on the landscape with this distinctive definition. Now we start to get to put the dressing on or covering is now applied to that framework. This is where the vegetation finally takes a priority role in understanding and describing the ecological concept. The vegetation is the siding, the roofing, potentially just the paint of the ecological concept, depending on the drivers and the, the true definition of that concept. In some instances, vegetation has more of a role in the framework than other times, but it always, always provides indicators of the abiotic factors of that ecological site. The vegetation also plays a major role of helping us understand the historic use and alterations of the responses to disturbances or timing of disturbances. Species help identify timing, duration, and type of disturbances that are a factor for the ecological site and specific communities that we're looking at. These responses are highly variable and are only evidence, but not the full depiction of what was has occurred over time. The factors that are a focus or that are identified as priority are the dominant species and the composition of those species within the community, understanding the production of the community, is the management based on total annual production, total palatable production, or board feed of production for timber and other commercial uses of that vegetative cover. Understanding the true canopy structure of the community, knowing the functional and structural groups of the plants and how individual species alter or impact the overall function of that overstory and understory are significant. A greater effort is being made to measure and track the complexities of the ground, soil surface, and woody ground cover. This cover is identifying bi biological crusts and the stability of specific soils, the fuel loads and potential shifts and disturbances that are occurring, and the relation to erosional stability and erosional risk, and then understanding the time and timing of the vegetative responses throughout a year is key to determining management of the system. So, as we're going through this, once we have everything else going, we have the shell built of our ecological concept, it is time to dive into the inner workings, the cabinets, the shelves, the drawers, and especially the wiring with that concept. The science of ecological concept is really identifying and understanding the indications of change on the landscape, and this is equivalent to those dynamic soil properties. Once once the change is identified, then the driver of change needs to be identified. This is where the details of how the soils, plants, and natural disturbances are interacting and how outside disturbances alter that interaction and what soil properties are altered within these interactions, describing the true dynamics of this system. With the increased data collection to capture the dynamic soil properties, the function of change over time is a significant factor with disturbance that we can now start put quantitative values to. The focus of change over a human time scale, starting with initial dec initially decades of change and then shifting out to centuries of change is a possibility as we move forward with science. Drivers of change or the disturbances and stressors that occur must consider both natural variability as well as the anthropogenic or human altered or affected stressors. And understanding these variations and the implications to soil properties can be difficult to research and understand. The overall relation between the vegetative change on the landscape are indicators of the soil function and soil change within the identified dynamic soil properties that include factors as listed. These are factors that have been identified for rangeland soil health, cropland soil health, and now soil health in general. 
from the common measurements of infiltration, aggregate stability, and permeability to more advanced data on soil crust to the soil enzymes and microbial community structures that are now that are living in the soil profile. So how do we move from the science of ecological site descriptions to placing conservation on the ground? Well, it goes back to that lingering lesson of conservation that I started with when I started my career. And this is one of my favorite acronyms that I will always remember. And it is summed up as SWAPA. So I don't know how many of you remember the acronym SWAPA, but as we move forward with conservation planning, it was really emphasized that soil, water, and air or the base of conservation, understanding what was going on on the ground, but that you had to look at the interaction between soil, water, and air, and then the interaction specifically between plants and animals. And that gave us a more dynamic interaction of what was going on in the landscape. And then finally, we had to stop and look at the human impact and the energy impacts from the different operations humans were doing that were occurring, interacting on our dynamics. And to help us with putting the pieces of SWAPA together within the ecological site, the state and transition model is really key. So the exciting part, again, of this development in SWAPA is the advancement and the development of state and transition models within the ecological site descriptions. The state and transition model, or STM, is a generic model to demonstrate the items and the pathways within the model. I'm sure you've seen these and seen more complex versions of the state and transition model, but I really like the simplified version to just simply show that there's the natural unaltered system or the reference state, and then begins to build into the natural interaction the plants and animals have within that state to identify the reference communities. As we move through the acronym, the human and energy effects start to take form in altered states, transitions and restoration pathways as well as community pathways within the model start to be developed and formed out with soil property, dynamic soil properties. The illustration of SWAPA provides a visual tool to take the field, to take to the field and help build the discussion with landowners and land managers for making more science-based and informed decisions on their property. The same transition model really is helping them to understand their, where their land fits into the model and to see the potential that exists within their situation. Before an in-depth look into the resource needs and risk, it is critical to work with the landowner and, and or land managers to identify the intentions for the land use by taking the time to in establishing client-based goals focus on land use, management decisions, assessments, and assessments can be consistent and occur efficiently and effectively across an entire operation. Goals should be developed for specific locations for a scope of management and defined for all land uses involved. In the initial stages, goals are established to focus on the objectives established by the client. And as resource elevation evaluations occur, then primary and secondary goals are developed looking at both objectives and available resource potential. A clear outline of the manpower, capital, and other resources the client has or is able to contribute to identify limitations and general operating abilities is key. Progressing in the planning process, the available resources and the resource needs to meet objectives can be identified for each goal. With further intensive resource inventory and review, these resource needs can be refined and applicability can be determined. The process is established to refine the goals based on the determined resource availability. So when we're working with the landowners or managers, it is key to take every opportunity to measure or research the potential of the communities within their ownership to help them see the true potential as well as the changes that are occurring on the landscape. Range on health is one process that helps landowners determine where they are at a point in time. And then with repetitive measurement over time, they can establish the trend of their rangeland health as management is applied to their operation. The three main attributes that are being evaluated is the soil and site stability, hydrologic function of the site, and the biotic integrity. 
Each of these have established quantitative factors that help measure each attribute. And many of these indicators overlap both in the quantitative indicator as well as the te techniques to measure the attributes. It also overlaps with those priorities that are established for dynamic soil survey, for dynamic soil properties, sorry. So to take another look at this, when the landowner or entity completes the rangeland health assessment, it is generally a measurement to the reference or not generally a reference to the reference or natural community, not altered by man-made disturbances. But as the state and transition models are further developed with data, the potential for landowners to compare where they are at on the ground to the potential of where they could be in the ecological site helps provide a clear insight of how management is helping with the transition and to identify more specifically the resource risks involved. The measurement or matrices for comparison for deviation from normal are also being developed, site-specific to help clarify the potential of each ecological site. These increases in data-driven tools helps to provide a scientific application of management on the ground. The key to successful planning is understanding the limitations in the land resources and ownership limitations. The first major step is to determine the resource risk concern, resource concern risk assessments, understanding the natural risk presented by the ecological site and the potential risk applied with each practice, change in management or shift in resources. Within this, it is key to examine and monitor the changes within vegetation based on functional and structural group composition, life form dominance, species composition, as well as plant health, vigor, distri distribution, and age classes. And it is pertinent to identify the specific drivers that have influenced or will influence these changes, including climatic variabilities, fire and other disturbance regimes, and looking at things like seed dispersal, utilization, and other management factors. It is also key to understanding the frequency of events and the scales of events that occur within the site concept or within that particular landscape. Each of these factors helps to highlight the key ecosystem services being impacted by changes, nutrient cycling, biodiversity and vegetation, as well as soil, soil microbial health and soil stability. Understanding the effects on uses, the resources themselves, and the value of the landscape are key to understanding site limitations. But the most management specific limitation to understand is the constraints to restoring a site back to a higher potential. Identifying the resources lost or altered properties that limit restoration and the biotic properties that are lost that help to target resource specific management limitations. The final step in the planning process for conservation is the adapt and invest. As client-based objectives and goals are aligned with the available resources, capital, and funds to minimize risk, then a plan can be developed to begin improvements or changes in management where necessary. Part of the planning is identifying the mitigation potential of misalignment in goals and resources. The mitigation plan may outline land improvements to be made on the landscape, but in many instances, it may be the development of an alternative land use plan. In determining mitigation potential and developing the plan, the most cost-effective and conservation-wise practices will be selected to meet the mitigation needed for both vegetation and to preserve the dynamic soil properties. Once the best laid plan is in place, then the landowner can have a science-supported investment decision for his limited capital, resources, and most specifically his human and management costs. But the bigger, biggest rule to follow is to reevaluate at every step of mitigation. Monitor, reevaluate, then adapt the plan and shift or reinvest the resources. Success can only be achieved if the inputs and resources are less than outputs or gains and the plan is sustainable. So, in summary, I just want to highlight the, the takeaway points. It is imperative to understand that ecological site descriptions are limited by the data and by scale. They are a great tool for assisting or providing guidance in conservation planning, but they are not the answer to the problem. Ecological site descriptions provide the general roadmap to the major and modal vegetative states and communities. It is not a catalog of all states, 
of all communities and of all vegetative species located within a specific ecological site. This is where the art of the science meets the road. Dynamic soil properties are generally not the cause or drivers of transitions or pathways, but they are a factor and indicator of the changes occurring or driving the transitions and pathways. And then finally, when applying conservation, there are key aspects that play a role in finding success. Success begins with understanding the resources that are available on the landscape, as well as available by the producer. This includes economic, capital, and manpower. The progress must proceed based on establishing goals and objectives that are aligned with the resource availabilities and limitations. The more specific the inventory and identification of potential and risks involved, and the better the monitoring of progress, the higher the success rate. This includes the evaluation and monitoring of the dynamic soil properties, as well as related vegetative and resource-based evaluations. And one of the most important factors to remember is this is not a one and done event. A continual process of evaluation, inventory, monitoring, and adaptive management and planning must occur. And although vegetation is important and tells much of the story, the foundation to conservation planning, ecological site descriptions, and the land potential begins with the soils. So in closing, I leave you with this insight. Science without trial and error is weak. Application without knowledge is risk. Proven science without application is futile, but data supported science with proven application is wisdom. So to apply this to our goals, verified ESDs are a wise tool developed with data-driven science applied to data-proven dynamics of management. And with that, I thank you for your time and your attention today, and I will open it up for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. I'm not seeing any questions right away. Folks, please type in your questions quick. We have a few minutes. Marjorie, there's certainly been some uh, uh, changes that have happened in, in uh, the science. Uh, what do you see as maybe one of the big ones coming up in the future? What are people studying and some new take on things or a new uh, procedure or process? What's What's new out there? I think one of the biggest, newest challenges that we'll be facing and with new technologies coming up is a lot of the remote sensing and more infrared type data that we're gaining that will help with climate change measurements, with the carbon levels and just general health of our vegetation based on reflectivity and, and aerial imagery perspectives, which will be exciting to help with some of the limited manpower but also just the learning curve to apply that into what we're learning into our ESDs and then getting the land base, the people that we are involved with to understand and use the tools that are out there like ESDs in their management because there's the land ownership has changed so significantly through the years and I believe it's going to continue to change. So it's going to be a, a matter of how can we sell ESDs to help them manage their landscape. Awesome. Well, we didn't have a question, but somebody did say excellent information, Margie, so. Well, I think we're going to move on. If you do have questions, please continue to put them into the chat. Uh, Margie will be able to answer those and they will be part of our final posting that we have. So thanks again and we'll move on. Do want to remind people that the next webinar is going to be January 9th. So put that on your calendars. Uh, notices will come out. And also uh, be sure and contact your regional uh, field notes coordinators to get your name on the list to pr make presentation. Our next presentation is going to be from Brandon Viverka out of Oklahoma. He's going to talk about dynamic soil properties on rangelands.
Brandon, the 31st Field Notes webinar is yours. All right, can you hear me, Dave? Sure can. All right, sounds good. I'm going to get started then. And well, my name's Brandon. I'm the MLRA soil scientist in Woodward, Oklahoma. And I'm not going to make this one as technical as the last time I was on talking about soil temperature monitoring and modeling. But uh, this one's just going to be uh, just bringing awareness to just while you're out there working on your DSP project, take some good notes of your ecological sites and especially during the reconnaissance and planning phase. And that pretty well sums up what I'm going to be talking about, but I'm just going to bring in some background and talk about oh, some properties that go into what to look for for the CSDs, which will bring me to my first slide. All right, so DSP and ecological sites, what to check. I'm going to go over some examples and scenarios, and then I'm going to discuss a couple real DSP projects, one being mine and then one out at the Lubbock, Texas office. And uh, we're going to go through those and try to look at the ecological sites within those projects and try to just determine some possible outcomes and uh, just kind of just really scrutinize those ecological sites and try to come up with some good questions. We're not going to be fixing anything today, but um, we're just going to be trying to point out some things, maybe talk to your um, local ecological scientist. So what to check? These are the main things to check. So if you take a ecological site description and you break it into pieces, these are going to be some of the bigger pieces. So you have the physiographic features, the climatic features and some water influences, soils, and then a big one's the ecological dynamics. So as far as the physiographic features go, uh, the main ones would be slope, elevation, aspect, landform, 2D, 3D, geomorphology. Because you have different plants growing on different landforms, just as you have different soils on different landforms, and they could develop in different populations on a terrace versus a floodplain or a hill slope versus on top of an interfluve. And then as far as aspect goes, some parts of the mountain might catch more snow, so you might have different plant populations there. And climatic features, um, there's precipitation, frost free period and temperature, just to name a few. And um, a lot of times you can look around and try to find some weather stations. And this one right here is a T-scan site out in western Oklahoma around Raiden, Oklahoma. And that's just a good place to get your weather data and try to determine what climate that you're in and make sure everything matches up. It's really important, especially if your MLRA kind of falls between a climate break. It can get a little bit confusing, not just for classifying the soils, but also for your ecological sites. And then water influences. So you can look at things like drainage class, runoff, flooding, ponding, and basically the things to look for here is just what's what's catching the water here. Is it kind of puddling up or is it running off the side or is it going into the ground really fast because of the soil? And just got to take note of the plant species that are there because a lot of times the plants will tell you how wet an area is. Now, when it comes to soil factors, there's many of them, but just to name a few, there's surface texture, depth, surface fragments, ground cover. And whenever it comes to ground cover on my 232s, um, I don't really write it down every time because a lot of the areas just look the same. But if I see a bunch of bare ground or something while I'm writing down my plants that I see, I make a note just being like, well, there's a lot of ground cover here. and and that way at least it's documented and it can be reviewed for future use and surface fragments um, I don't have too many surface fragments around here other than nodules but one thing I do make note of is um, well they call it soil farming and it's where they dump drilling mud on the land and you can usually pick that up because you'll see little pieces of gravel that don't really belong and little bits of mica and I just make note of things like that and and as far as soil goes, um, 
CCE and sodium absorption ratio are two things. Like if I see a BKK horizon and it's up pretty high, I kind of wonder what the CCE is going to be on that. And same thing if I have a high pH, I just wonder if it's going to have a high sodium absorption ratio too. So those are just some things to keep in mind. Uh, a lot of you probably already know that, but I just want to just um, reiterate that. And then lastly, there's the ecological dynamics. Now this could be a whole presentation by itself, but just to sum it up briefly, these are just some questions you should be asking while you're out there. What plants are there? How's it managed? And what state's it in? And for example, just looking off on that picture to the right, so what plants you see there? Well, there's some sod-bound buffalo grass, eh, probably some either hairy grama or blue grama, then some little tufts of side oats and little blue stems sticking up. So how's it managed? You think this is managed very well? It looks a little bit overgrazed to me. And what state's it in? Well, it's according to RESD and the state and transition model currently, this would be a overgrazed drought stress state. And this was also in a drought whenever I took this picture. So that's just an example of just kind of thinking through what's there while you're out there. Now to move into some specific projects. This is one I worked on an MLRA 77E, and we're looking at cropland that was returned to grassland on loamy Holocene terrace soils converted from cropland to grassland. And this is the Southern High Plains breaks. So we're not on top of the plains. This is just the sides of the high plains where it kind of broke off over the years. And we're looking at dynamic soil properties and also ecological site health and trying to document some changes and the ecological site was specifically the Lomi Upland ESD. And our soil series, in case you're wondering, was Abbey, Irene, Texroy, Derizette, Croker, and Chiquita. But I mainly focused on the Irene, Texroy, Derizette, and I had one Abbey in there. I tried to stay with some uh, deep packet soils. And here's the taxonomy for every one of those, in case you're wondering. Uh, Croker and Chiquita just have a calcic horizon that's a little bit higher up, but you you can find a calcic horizon in all these. Um, it's just it's just deeper to the calcic. And these are very highly productive soils. Um, they're they, they're very productive and well, they can call them a benchmark soil. So a lot of these were farmed and farmed heavy. And this is just the area of the project, just to give you all an idea of where I'm at. So you got Texas and Oklahoma, then Oklahoma Panhandle and the North Texas Panhandle. And most of my study was kind of right up in this area. And the greens, the MLRA, and the yellows, the soils of interest. Now this is the Lomi Upland State and Transition Model. And whenever you're reading these, they, they get broken down into different groups and these lines connecting the boxes are how they get changed from state to state. And the one in the last picture I showed you was the, supposed to be mid short grass, but there's a lot more buffalo grass there than blue grama. And then if you read the legend, it'll give you a description of those changing. And that's another thing to look at too, is see if those changes are in your state and transition model. So I had seven treatments. I had a zero to two year improved and the improved species was old world blue stem is what I would find around here. And then I had zero to two years going from cropland to grassland of native species, then two to eight years improved in native. Then I had treatment of 20 years improved in native species. And then to try to find a reference date, um, it was native rangeland. And finding a 
reference date here was really difficult, especially in Oklahoma, because Oklahoma was under the Homestead Act. So everything that could be farmed was farmed. Well, I guess even if it couldn't be farmed, they tried farming it here. So now this is just an example of the sites I was looking at. So that picture earlier is the one on the left that was drought stress drought stressed and overgrazed. That was the native rangeland supposed to be my reference state. And the soil looked amazing, but the grass did not. And on the other hand, we have this 30 year improved species where the vegetation looks amazing, but you can still see a heavy plow pan in this soil even 30 years later. So you just can't really tell what the soil is going to be like just by looking at the plants. And one thing I found amazing about this improved 30 year pasture was native species started to pop up in there because I was finding Indian grass and um, side oats and little blue stem. And I've I always thought that old world blue stem had its own aliopathy and would kind of weed out the natives, but not in the case here. And we have three year tall grass species versus 70 year tall grass species. The three year tall grass species was very well managed. And this was even during a drought year whenever I took that picture and it still looks that good, which is impressive where the 70 year tall grass species looks good. And the 70 year tall grass species had more soil health characteristics um, than the three year. So the 70 year had a certain type of biotic crust and um, there's just more biotic features in that soil. But believe it or not, after being planted to grass for 70 years, there was still a plow pan. You could still see it, which I found amazing. But I think that has to just do with the climate here and only getting about 18, 19 inches of rain probably has something to do with it. Now we have two year improved species versus eight year improved species and they look pretty similar. Both are hayed. Um, the two year improved species had a very hard plow pan in a fine particle size family soil and it had a, a little bit of a struggle getting up for the breaking through the plow pan and oh, getting a good stand in. And but after the weeds were um, eaten down by some heavy grazing, the old world blue stem started to take over. And now it's a great stand of grass. Lastly, the one year tall grass species. So, and that one was in a good year for adequate rainfall and it had no trouble growing. So now, after looking at all these sites, looking at the state and transition model, it kind of raised some questions whenever I was looking at other ecological sites throughout our MLRA. And so there's loamy upland and then there's clay loam. And if you read the ESD and loamy upland, it mentions that the soil can either be loamy or clay loam, or clay loam is just clay loam soil. And under certain management conditions, I found it interesting how the loamy upland sites out on the eastern part of the Texas Panhandle look the pretty similar to the clay loam eco sites further west in the Texas Panhandle. Because we look at the picture on the right, you see, well, sod bound buffalo grass. And then over to the left two pictures, you just see uh, more buffalo grass, maybe a little bit more bare ground where the choya cactuses are, but as far as that picture goes on the top left and comparing it to the one on the right, the only thing the one on the right's missing is the mesquite trees. So that would be one of the main questions, for example, which I would bring up to an ES specialist. So my last real life example is going to be one that the Lubbock, Texas office is working on. And this one's looking at Playa soils in the Southern High Plains. And this is the Playa ecological site. 
they have two soils. They have McLean and then there's Randall. So it's a fine soil versus a very fine. And whenever I say fine for McLean, it's about 55% clay in the control section, where Randall's probably about 65% clay in the control section. So it's pretty close as far as particle size go, but the main difference is the Glade matrix and the redox features in the Randall. Now here's the ecosystem states for the Playa ecological site. And they're just range from drier to wetter. And that's enough to change the plants. So we have then within the environmental states, you have the submodel plant communities. So state one, which was the drier one, can either go from your mid grass forb to your grass-like forbs and annuals community and then once you get a little bit more water involved you get more hydro hydrophilic plant communities and plants that like water more so this is what the mclean series should look like on the surface it should just look like a dry playa with some grass in it Now the Randall series should hold water, but both sites will hold water. Um, it's just only the, well, what you would call the normal years where you would really tell the difference between which one's holding water and which one's not. Because whenever it's a dry year, both of these playas are dry. Whenever it's a wet year, both of these playas are full. So this leads us to the discussion of the project and Oh, one thing that we were talking about here is should there be two eco sites? Have a more wet playa versus a drier playa? Because like I said, when it's wet, it's wet, and but whenever it's dry, it's dry, and both sites look the same on the surface. And only in the quote unquote normal years you can tell the differences. And but the plants do seem to be slightly different but ever so slightly where it's difficult to tell the difference. Um, I think the only real way to tell a difference would be a lot of data and possibly um, keeping a good inventory, maybe using some remote sensing techniques to verify. So now the closing remarks. Um, for one, study the ESD. Also know how it keys out. Uh, just just double check the keys whenever you're out there too, because if you're using a key, it should point to the same site every single time. And know what to look for. We went over that at the beginning of the presentation. And follow your DSP data collection standards. Um, also, don't be shy to reach out to ES specialists for help. Uh, being a soil scientist, I'm not the best with plants, but I know people that are, so that, that's very helpful. And lastly, whenever you're doing this, question everything. Because in my area, my MLRA, um, all of our ecological sites are provisional. Um, there hasn't been any ES verification done yet, so, um, so don't be afraid to ask questions whenever you're out there. It'll just help make a better product in the end. All right, that's all I have. Any questions? Thanks, Brendan. We're waiting for a few to get typed in. Uh, you'll have to come back again and give us the uh, results of the uh, decision on one or two eco sites out there. Oh, yeah, I could do that. While we're waiting, I uh, did have a question. And some of that converted uh, cropland, uh, when it's grassland now, uh, do they do much to deep ripping out there? No, that was a question that I was that I put on the landowner questionnaire was asked if it's, if it's been ripped or deep tilled. And um, so that site where the stand had a difficult time, um, he didn't rip it before. And I think if he would have just ripped it before going in with planning, he would have had a lot better stand off the bat because that plow pan was tight. Whenever I was digging it with the backhoe, even the backhoe was struggling. 
it was just it was just ripping out in big chunks but yeah that's a really good question i was wondering the same but i don't think any of these sites were ripped before they were planted i haven't seen a whole lot of that going on i've seen some further south but Give another minute here to see if any questions pop up. One question did pop up earlier from RG, which you'll be able to answer offline. Again, I want to remind folks that the next webinar is going to be January 9th. Well, I'm not seeing any quick typists there, Brandon. So oh, we, you we did have one come in. I'm sorry. Oh. I don't know if it's if it's showing up on, on my end. I pushed it through, but oh. I wasn't sure if it was coming on your end or not. I just I'm just seeing it right now. Hey, hey I'll, it's uh, for you, Brandon. It's I love how you use a DSP project to better understand both the soils and the ESD. How do you prioritize what soils or ESDs to focus on? Um. That's a that's a really big question, but just to kind of give it a start is um, well, I like to start at the tech team meetings um, during the year and then I just ask the technical team um, just what projects they want to see and I kind of just go from there. And then I can really focus in on a single project and some other things to think of is um, like what Katina soils do you think? would be easier to find um, as far as your treatments go. And I knew that if I found, it'd be easier for me to find the treatments I wanted on this Katina soils than if I would have picked a sandy site that's usually rangeland. So there's just a lot of decision making that goes into it. Um, I hope that's a good start. Okay, thanks. And uh, the next one is a, a statement and then a question. Uh, the criteria for defining one or two ESs should be based on user need. I'd be inclined to think that the users would want to know if playa flooding happens on their site. Question, what benefits do you see from doing more than one soil or ecological site for a DSP project? Um, well, as far as a lot of times you can group soils together uh, into a soil katina and a lot of those would have the same ecological a lot of those could have the same ecological site but the soil would be a little different mostly because the soil is going to inter and in, interpretate pretty similar the interpretations are going to end up the same on a lot of these soils so that's how you can group the soils together just based on the interpretations Okay. Oh, looks like maybe one more is just coming through here. Regarding the T scan data and developing ESD concepts, where do you get your 30 year normal climate data from? From the Western Regional Climate Center? What is the 30 year period being summarized for your area? Do you look at anything beyond 30 year schemes? No. Last I heard is that the data was from was derived from prism data and what period oh, of there, what were you there is one source in oklahoma called the oklahoma mesonet and they do have some records going back 100 years but i haven't sat down and um, tried to total it all up from 100 years well I'll tell Tyson Oxner that you mentioned the mesonet, so he'll, he'll be pleased to know that. 
Yeah, Tyson Oxygen was on my graduate committee at, ah, at Oklahoma okay. State. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think that does it for our questions. Uh, again, I thank both presenters for a couple of great presentations today. I thank the organizers uh, of the uh, teleconference, the webinar, and certainly thank the audience for your attention and your questions. Y'all have a good rest of your week. Bye now. <laughs>